Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. Happy it's good, Sabbath. It's good to be with you this morning. And our lesson today is All Nations and Babel. We're going to be talking about the Tower of Babel and some um, events that happened up to the Tower of Babel and uh, a few after. So this is, this is a pivotal time in history, and we'll get into why that is in just a minute. But Greg, would you pray for us this morning? It would be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful Sabbath morning. And Lord, we thank you for this time that we're able to get together and to study your word. We ask and pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be upon each of us, that we may understand the guiding principles that you really want us to take to heart and to share with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So our, our memory verse is, therefore its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So after the flood, we see times and seasons coming back. We see um, Genesis 8.22 says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. So we see here that God says <clears throat> that the seasons will last as long as the earth lasts. And then again, we know after the flood, we studied last week, that he would dis not destroy the earth again with the flood. So God's first command to humanity after the flood um, was an affirmation around life. He said in Genesis 9-1, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So this is the same thing that God told them uh, initially in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? And we'll get into that in a minute. The, there's another piece that is interesting after the flood, and that is he changed man's diet. After the, after the flood, we see the first time that man was given meat to eat by God. And we see this in Genesis 9, 2, and 3. Every moving thing that lives shall be for meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. So we see this too, we see this said again, about the blood in Levitical law, where it says, um, it shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout the dwellings. You shall, either, neither, you shall eat neither the fat nor the blood. So God is giving man the, the diet of meat, but he is not allowing them to eat the, the blood. And this is interesting because it's really the only um, reason, the only dietary law explanation of why this is. And he gives two reasons. There's a health reason and a religious reason. So in the health respect, we see um, there's toxins in the blood. In the religious and creation, we see, we see creation in that as well, and atonement. So we see that this blood was that, um, especially with the sacrifice of animals, the blood was atonement for sin. So we have a spiritual application, and then we also have a health application. We remember in creation, this was before anything had died, so there was no, no need for blood. So the focus of this lesson, as we go through this week, will be to confront the human attempt to fulfill the command, this commandment. So far, the biblical account concerned individuals Adam, Eve, Cain, Seth, and Noah. In this lesson, the stories concern groups of people and will have a universal scope. The survivors of the flood, the three sons of Noah, will generate three branches of humanity, which will constitute the nations of the world. It seems that humanity is on track to filling the earth and bringing God's image to all the ends of the earth, 
Yet the story of the Tower of Babel marks a dramatic break in this momentum. God's commission of universality is replaced by the human ideal of unity, uniformity. Humans want to be one, and worse, we're going to see how they want to be God. So we're going to look at some themes in this. We're going to see curses and blessings. We see with Ham was cursed. We also see another curse at the time of um, Babel. We see universality and unity, and we see that with the nations of the world wanting to, gain, want, wanting to engage in a common project to go against God. And then the usurpation of God, the builders of Babel dreamed of reaching to heaven. And so we'll look into what, what their thinking process was as we get into this more. Another area we're going to pay attention to is Ham, the father of Canaan. So Genesis 10, 6, and 15 introduces the idea of Canaan, which was the promised land we see later on in scripture and we'll be studying in the near future was the promised land to Abraham. So the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. Canaan begot Sidon, the firstborn of Heth. An anticipation of Abraham whose blessings will go to all nation. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and his brother Lot, and Lot his brother, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had inquired in Haran, and they departed for the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, where God encounters blessings to Abraham. He says in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. However, the line is broken by the Tower of Babel, and the reason is because some of the descendants of Noah soon began to apostatize. A portion followed the example of Noah and obeyed God's commands. Others were unbelieving and rebellious, and even these did not believe alike in regard to the flood. Some disbelieved the existence of God and in their minds accounted for the flood from natural causes. Others believed that God existed and that he destroyed the antediluvian race by a flood, and their feelings, like Cain's, rose in rebelliousness against God. He destroyed the people from the earth and cursed the earth a third time by the flood. And we see that um, in Ellen White's The Story of Redemption. So once again, God's plans for humankind are disrupted. What was supposed to be a blessing the birth of all nations becomes another occasion for another curse. The nations unite in order to take God's place. God responds in judgment on them, and through resulting confusion, the people get scattered throughout the world. So God was going to scatter them one way or the other. So in Genesis 11:8, we see um, this concept of God's fulfilling his plan to fill the earth. It says, so God scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. <clears throat> in the end, in spite of human wickedness, God turns evil into good. He has, as always, the last word, the curse of Ham in his father's tent, and the curse of confusing the nations for the Tower of Babel. Eventually, though, this all turns into blessing and for um, the nations, and they did go forth and populate the earth like he asked them to. Okay. So, <clears throat> Mary, tell us more about this curse with him. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> We're going to begin learning more about this curse of Ham by reading Genesis chapter 9, and that's verses 18 to 27. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine as was, and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham 
the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be a servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now Barbara covered a little bit on who Ham was. He was Noah's second son, and he's the father of Canaan. That's mentioned twice in this passage. He did have other children, but we're going to focus on Canaan and his descendants. So let's analyze these verses. What did Noah do after resettling the earth? Well, in verses 20 and 21, we read that he became a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he made wine from the grapes in his vineyard, got drunk, and somehow ended up uncovered or naked in his tent. Fermentation wasn't part, fermentation of fruit wasn't part of God's original creation. For some unknown reason, Noah indulged, lost self-control, and undressed himself. So what happened then? In verse 22, Ham walks into his father's tent, finds him sleeping and naked. Then he goes out and tells his brothers. So Ham may have accidentally walked in on his father, but instead of helping him, he went around talking about his embarrassing situation with his brothers. In fact, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 117, we read, The unnatural crime of Ham declared that filial reverence had long before been cast from his soul. So these are strong words, the unnatural crime of Ham. And filial reverence meant that he, the reverence that is due from a son or daughter to their parent. Ham had lost respect for his father, and he ended up breaking the fifth commandment and dishonoring him. Now, on the other hand, what did Ham's brothers do? In verse 23, they laid a garment on their shoulders and walked backward into the tent with their faces turned away. So they took the extra effort to ensure they would not see their father's nakedness, and they covered him. So Shem and Japheth's response was to help their father. They showed respect, reverence, and honor for him by not looking upon him, and by covering him. As we continue with the story, in verse 24, Noah awakens and is told what has happened. And then what does he do? Verse 25, first he pronounces a curse, not directly upon him, but upon one of his sons, Canaan. And I'd like to share this additional insight from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, Noah speaking by divine inspiration, foretold the history of the three great races to spring from these fathers of mankind, tracing the descendants of Ham through the son rather than the father, he declared, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. Now remember what she had said about Ham's unnatural crime that it declared his lack of reverence and his utterly evil character. So she continues, these evil characteristics were perpetuated in Canaan and his posterity, whose continued guilt called upon them the judgments of God. Now what did Canaan have to do with the incident? He's not even there. What Noah is stating is that Canaan has the same irreverent, wicked mindset as Ham, his father, and that's by choice. And he's continuing in Ham's footsteps. And due to this choice, he will someday become a slave to his brethren. In addition, please note that this 
verse by no means is a theological endorsement for slavery or for racism, that would be a gross mistake. The prophecy was restricted to Canaan only, and God was very patient and long-suffering with Canaan's irreverence and corruption. He gave his descendants many opportunities to learn of him and repent, but they chose to continue in their wickedness. So let's move on. After the curse of Ham, who received a blessing? In verses 26 and 27, it tells us the blessings Noah spoke to Shem and Japheth. In contrast to Ham, they manifested reverence to their father and thus for the divine statutes. And this promised a brighter future for their descendants. Shem's line would be that of the chosen people from whom the Messiah would come. And as for Japheth, his descendants would dwell in the tents of Shem. What does that mean? It means that in the blessings of the gospel, his descendants were especially to share. This is a prophetic allusion to the expansion of God's covenant to all nations that will embrace the message of salvation. So was this prophecy of Noah an arbitrary denunciation of wrath or declaration of favoritism? Not at all. Inspiration tells us it did not fix the character and destiny of his sons, but it showed what would be the result of the course of life they had each separately chosen and the character they had developed. As a rule, children inherit the dispositions and tendencies of their parents and imitate their example so that the sins of the parents are practiced by the children from generation to generation. So though the prophetic curse had doomed them to slavery, the doom was withheld for centuries, and God bore with their impiety and corruption until they passed the limits of divine forbearance. This story highlights how important our choices are and how they impact our character and our destiny. In addition, the name Canaan is derived from the verb cana, meaning subdue. It's through the subduing of Canaan that God's people, the descendants of Shem, will enter the promised land and prepare the way for the Messiah who will extend the covenant of salvation to Japheth, meaning all the nations. And he extended it to Ham and Canaan's descendants if they choose to accept the salvation offered to them. So despite the ugly story that transpired within Noah's family, God ultimately desired a blessing and declared salvation upon every one of Noah's descendants if they accepted his salvation. Praise God for his great love toward all of us, even toward those of us who are wicked and evil. And with this, we can move on to Monday's lesson. Greg, you get the genealogy. I get the genealogy. And it's a wonderful <coughs> subject. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at it in a little bit of detail, but then we're going to back up and understand what the guiding principles are of genealogy and what is God really trying to, to show us and to tell us. So um, we're going to begin in looking at Genesis chapter 10. And we're not going to go through the whole chapter. In fact, we're just going to mention it except for the very last verse, verse 32. And the reason being is because it goes name after name after name, and we only have so much time in order to go through this lesson. But Genesis chapter 10, it's the genealogy and the descendants of Noah, which has been covered um, initially right now by Mary and by Barbara. But understanding that in chapter 10, it outlines all the offspring of Noah. And in verse 32, it concludes that genealogy by stating, these are the clans of Noah's sons according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. So if we look at that, and then we are also directed in, thir in uh, Monday's lessons to look at Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. And that's the genealogy of Jesus. And that begins with Jesus and then goes back 
to Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, and continues all the way back to Shem, the son of Noah, and subsequently back to Adam. Then, if we look at Matthew's account of the genealogy, Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 17, that is also the genealogy of Jesus, but Matthew takes us on a ge genealogical timeline from Abraham to Jesus. Okay, so, and Matthew also states, from the time of Abraham to Jesus, there are 42 generations. So if we take those 42 generations and then overlay Luke's account, and Luke, again, he goes all the way from Adam to Abraham to Jesus. So from Adam to Abraham, there's 20 generations. So in all, the total number of generations, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to footnote this, the total number of generations from Adam to Jesus is between 62 and 76 generations. And you say, well, wait a minute, how can that be? Isn't it just 62? You have the 20 under the 42? Well, it just depends. It depends on if you're following the line of Mary or the line of Joseph. And also, the difference in those two numbers, it can mostly be resolved by the fact that Matthew traces the line through Solomon. So from King David's offspring, he traces it from Solomon, while Luke traces the line through uh, David's son, Nathan. And Matthew, what he's doing is he's giving his readers the legal genealogy through Jesus' adoptive father, Joseph, while Luke gave his readers Jesus' natural genealogy. So that's the granular part. So now we're going to step back from that. But I first want to ask you, isn't that extraordinary and amazing that God gives us, he provides us a genealogical timeline of our creation and the genealogy of Jesus dating all the way back to Adam. I, th I think that's so amazing that he provided that for us. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what's the function or purpose of genealogy in the Bible? And there are really three functions. First is it provides a historical timeline of biblical events that relates to real people. These are real documented people who lived and died and whose days were specifically numbered. And we see that all through scripture at the beginning part as to how many years um, Noah lived and how many years Adam lived, um, even down to Moses. And so that's an important point to understand. Then the second function is it demonstrates the continuity or links time between antiquity and contemporary times of the writers, and thus it helps to establish a very clear link from the past to the present, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And that's very critical because when we really look at the New Testament is, a, is partially a fulfillment of the Old Testament. So it's real important for us to understand. But third, and this is where we're going to concentrate a little bit more of our time today. Third, it reminds us of our fallen nature and the tragic effects of sin and Satan's efforts to malign God's word and character to all generations. And to all generations that have followed in human history and as documented in scripture. So then what's the significance? What's the significance of genealogy in the Bible? What's the significance from the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, first, again, they're another element of proof that God's word is truth and trustworthy. The other body of information other than genealogy is prophecy. So genealogy provides us with extra evidence and proof that God's word is true and trustworthy. And God provides for us the origin of humanity, as mentioned, and the lineage of the Messiah through the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we can trace our genealogy and his genealogy, Jesus' genealogy, back to Adam. Again, that's amazing. Second, it shows that his word is truth for all humanity, yet the enemy has been and will try to malign, distort, and to turn God's word, which is beautiful, he will turn his word into a lie, a deception, a distortion. And that's something that we need to be aware of as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, to really be able to understand 
what this big picture is, is trying to tell us, what God's trying to tell us. Seventh-day Adventists, we're supposed to be preaching the three angels' message of Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, to the world, and to call people out of worship, worshiping a falsely represented God and rightfully represent and worship the Creator who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. But unfortunately, as the Bible tells us, that under Satan's influence, ancient Israel misrepresented God and genealogy, which caused elitism and conflict. And Satan tries to malign God's truth regarding genealogy, but Jesus shines light on the enemy's darkness in John chapter 8, verse 34 through 45. So I'm going to read this because this is how Jesus shines light into darkness. Jesus answered them, and these were his accusers, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to him, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you do not want. He was a murderer from the beginning. I'm sorry, I misspoke that. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. So they taught and believed that their genealogy determined their virtue and their righteousness of favor from God. By tracing their genealogy back to Abraham, they believed this was a means that they were exclusively blessed by God and entitled to the inheritance promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Paul says this is foolish thinking. He states in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that may teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to teach, to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. So, what does this say about God and his love for humanity? God gave us a detailed evidence of who we are and where we came from and where we're going. And the rest of the world today is struggling to answer those questions. Why are we here? Where are we going? What's our purpose? God's given that to us. So God has provided all the answers for us. And this is the significance of the genealogy of Genesis, Matthew, and Luke. And if we understand and trust the word of God rightfully, and we rightfully represent him, then the genealogy in the Bible is not to be used against one another as a means of worthiness or, uh, for salvation, nor to be used to misrepresent the character of God. It's to be a blessing. We know that where we've come from, we know where we're going, and we can trace the genealogy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Savior. What a blessing. And I wish I could go into much more, but I know my time is far past. Um, but it was a very rich lesson, and I, and I really encourage you to go and look at the genealogy lessons. 
Back to Thank you, you Greg. <laughs> when I looked at genealogy, I thought, it's going to be interesting to see how he handles that one. You did a great job. Thank you. Okay, we're going to talk about one language. <clears throat> so let's jump into um, Genesis 11, 1 through 4. And it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had made, they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. Some uh, translations say tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. <clears throat> so let's unpack these scriptures. When we talk about the whole earth, we're really talking about a very small group of people because the earth had been destroyed and now they, it was just in the, in the becoming repopulated. And so um, as we look at this small group wanting to build this tower, we need to look at their real intentions. And um, that was, and we're going to see in some of these, these scriptures that we're going to look at, was basically replace God, the creator. Significantly, the description of the people's intentions and actions echo God's intentions and actions in the creation account. So we're going to look at a couple of these words that they say and how it mirrors creation account. So this, this, um, this concept of they said, and we see that in verses, we just read those in verses 3 and 4. But if we look at Genesis 1, 6, 9, and 14, then God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the water and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God, then God said, let there be <clears throat> waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let there appear dry land and it was so. And then in verse 14, then God said, let there be light in the firmament firmament of the heavens to divide the day from night and let them be, be signs and seasons and for days and years. And so we see this, this concept of they said in Genesis we see how many times God said. And so um, you, you see that, that correlation. Another correlation we see is where they say let us make. See, they're taking on these attributes that really belong to God. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And then they said, Let us build ourselves a city. So if we look at it and compare it with Genesis 1.26, then they said, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image. So while the... the these, these, this group of people were saying, let us build. God is saying, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and all earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So their intention is exactly stated. Let us make a name for ourselves. And this, is, this one is, is also in correlation with how God spoke. We see in Isaiah, God says in Isaiah 63, 12 through 14, who led them to the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water from them to make himself an everlasting name. So we see God dividing the water makes himself an everlasting name. And the, 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 those building the Tower of Babel were saying, we want to make a name for ourselves. So they're wanting to be like God. As the beast goes down into the valley and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. And so <clears throat> we see that as well in Isaiah 14. 
So in short, these builders of Babel entertain the misplaced ambition to replace God as their creator. Now, who else wanted to replace God as, as, as God and creator? I think we know if we look at uh, Isaiah 14, 14, where Satan says, I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And so it's very easy to see who was behind their intentions in building this tower. There were some things that, that played into um, this, the memory of the flood that we had read from Ellen White earlier that um, at play, played a role. Um, they were some, some feared that um, God would not keep his promise. The memory of the flood had been um, preserved in tradition, albeit distorted, in the, in the tradition of Babylon. You can see that in the Babylonian writings. So this effort to reach to heaven and usurp God will indeed characterize the spirit of Babylon. And we see that even all throughout history, the history of Babylon, you see them wanting to usurp God, wanting to be God. This is the same spirit we studied with Cain in Lesson 3, if you remember. Cain wanted to do it his way. He wanted, he wanted his sacrifice to be okay. And when it didn't, he used force, didn't he, to kill his brother. Cain wanted to be in charge. And so um, we see that um, this structure that they built was magnificent and lavish. And in fact, as you, as you read the Spirit of Prophecy, and I, I, I encourage you all to go and read chapter 9, about the Tower of Babel and Patriarchs and Prophets, because Ellen White explains that these dwellings were lavish. They were beautiful dwellings, and they had areas set up as places of worship going up, up this tower where they could, could build to the gods. And, um, and so this was not any small undertaking, but quite a, a, an extraordinary um, creation that they were building. This is why the story of the Tower of Babel is such an important motif in the book of Daniel, even. We see that in Daniel. The reference to Shinar, which introduced the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11-2, reappears again in the book of Daniel in order to designate the place where Nebuchadnezzar brought the articles of the temple. So Daniel 1-2 says, And God gave King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of, of his God. So we see Shinar, we come back to still this whole motif, this whole concept of, of this area, Satan wanting to set up for himself. Among many other passages of the book, um, the episode of Nebuchadnezzar's erecting the golden statue, probably close to the same place on the, on the plain, is the most illustrative of his, this frame of mind. In his visions of the end, Daniel sees the same scenario of the nations of the earth gathering together to achieve unity against God. That same unity, God said, is not to be for the nations of the earth. And we see that in Daniel uh, 2.43, where he says, And you shall not see iron mixed with clay. So the nations would not cleave together. And over time, we see that man has tried to, to combine, to combine uh, nations. We see it with, um, we see it in Europe, where the kings would, would, would intermarry. And they tried everything, but God has... Even to this day, we're not seeing this cleaving one to another. Uh, Daniel eleven forty three through 45 goes on to say, He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt. Also, the Libya, Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow their heed. But the news from the east and from the north shall trouble him. Therefore, she shall go out with great fury and destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of this of his palace between the seas and the glorious mountain. 
yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. So we see this over and over trying to, to unite the world. And in Revelation 6, 14 to 16, it says, through, his, through this attempt, though this attempt fails here, as it did with the, the Tower of Babel as well, for they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out before the kings of the earth to the whole world to gather them for battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered together to the place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. So even now as we sit here today, we see the world trying to unite and to, I, I think I heard our president just say a few days ago, there will be a new world order and we need to be the leader. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch how this all plays out. Mary. And we know ultimately how it ends. Yes, we Praise do. Praise God. So we're going to continue with the story of the Tower of Babel. And we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 to 7. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So first of all, why did God have to come down to the earth? In verse 5 it says he wanted to see the city and the tower. So the sons of men are progressing in their plans they stated their plans, and now they've actually started building the city and the tower. They wanted to ascend the heavens and be as God. But the reality was God had to descend from heaven to reach mankind. Now, couldn't God see all this from heaven? Why should he have to come down? In Psalms 139, verses 7 to 10, we read, where can I go from your spirit? This is King David speaking. Or where can I flee from your presence? And he's talking to God. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, or other versions say the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall uphold me. So what King David is saying that God is omniscient and he's omnipresent. He knew of their plans and saw it all from heaven. However, the fact that he came down emphasizes his direct involvement in humanity. Genesis states twice about God coming down. This implies how much he cared about what was happening down here. So what did God say about the city dwellers purposes first he says they're one in language he says they are one in their objective and goal and this is a oneness a confederacy founded in rebellion and what their wicked imaginations propose to do they will do so here's a major problem the people are opening openingly rebelling against God again Inspiration states in Patriarchs and Prophets, first, that this whole undertaking was designed to turn the minds of future generations away from God and lead them into idolatry. Secondly, they were unwilling to listen to God's truths and they murmured against him. Third, they had no desire to retain God and their knowledge. While they were rejecting God, they were accepting the rule of the cruelest of tyrants, Satan. And lastly, all this led to human sacrifices of their own children. And God's attributes of justice, purity, and love were supplanted by oppression, violence, and brutality. So how does God solve this problem? 
he comes down and confuses their language. Angels also intervened in the communications between the builders at the top of the tower and the supplies at the base of the tower. The misunderstandings led to rage and disappointment, confusion and dismay broke out, and the work came to a standstill. The confederacy ended in strife and bloodshed, and according to inspiration, lightnings from heaven as evidence of God's displeasure broke off the upper portion of the tower and cast it to the ground. Men were made to feel that there is a God who rules in heaven. I'd like to share this from Matthew Henry's Bible commentary. It says, now observe here, the mercy of God in moderating the penalty and not making it proportionable to the offense. For he deals not with us according to our sins. He does not say, let us go down now in thunder and lightning and consume those rebels in a moment. Or, he also didn't say, let the earth open up and swallow up them and their building. No. He only says, let us go down and scatter them. Henry continues saying, they deserved death but are only banished or scattered. For the patience of God is very great towards a provoking world. God's intervention was an act of mercy. Sister White adds that there were some in Babel who feared the Lord and cried out to him to interpose. She continues, in mercy to the world, he, meaning God, defeated the purpose of the tower builders and overthrew the memorial of their daring. In mercy, he confounded their speech, thus putting a check on their purposes of rebellion. God bears long with the perversity of men, giving them ample opportunity for repentance, but he marks all their devices to resist the authority of his just and holy law. From time to time, the unseen hand that holds the scepter of government is stretched out to restrain iniquity. I'd like to conclude by reminding us of God's continual love and mercy manifested throughout the first few chapters in Genesis that we've studied. First, we eat of the forbidden fruit. God shows us mercy with a covenant promising a savior offering salvation. Then Cain murders his brother. God shows mercy toward him with a mark so he would not be murdered. Then the wickedness of the antediluvians is on track to annihilate creation. And God shows mercy by preserving one family and many creatures through a worldwide flood. And lastly, as we've studied, now our post-diluvian ancestors propose to establish a universal kingdom independent of God, established in self-exaltation, and God shows mercy by confusing their language and scattering them. Praise God for his long-suffering mercy towards us all. And now we can continue on with Thursday's lesson. The okay. redemption of the exile? Yes. The redemption of the exile. So... <clears throat> Mary did a, a real wonderful job in pointing out to us the, uh, the construction of the Tower of Babel and then the destruction of the top part. And she loaded us with a bunch of facts, and I love that. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull back a little bit and talk about some of the principles behind that. So again, Thursday's lesson is titled The Redemption of the Exile. So let's begin by reading a few reference points in God's Word. So if you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 and it says, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. We've heard this many, many times, right? But we're going to go over this for a reason. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So on the sixth day of creation, after creating man in God's image, God said for the first time, be fruitful. Let's read further. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 and 7. 
So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Verse 7, he continues after making um, some more statements there. But he continues and says in verse 7, And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So God is telling humanity, yes, he's telling um, Noah and his sons and the offspring to go and multiply. He told Adam and Eve on behalf of humanity to go and multiply. So three times already, God has instructed his people to go be fruitful and to multiply. And if we look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, 8, and 9, something happens. So the descendants of Noah journeyed from the east to the plain of Shinar and dwelt there and wanted to build for themselves a city and a tower. So let's read the verses, uh, Genesis 11, 4, 8, and 9. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest us we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So what happened here? Who were these descendants of Noah? Well, we know that they came from his three sons. But really, what happened here? What caused this divergence? So I also want to just touch on the fact that Babel, as we know, we've heard this many times. In the Hebrews, it's actually pronounced Babel. In the English, we say Babel, but it's Babel. And it means confusion, to confuse. But the Lord gives us further insight as to what happened to these descendants of Noah through the Holy Spirit and inspired Ellen White in her book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 128 and page 129. I'm going to read two paragraphs here. They're brief paragraphs, but I'm going to read them because it really provides some very good insight as to what happened. For a time, the descendants of Noah continued to dwell among the mountains where the ark had rested. As their numbers increased, apostasy soon led to division. Those who desired to forget their creator and to cast off the restraint of his law felt a constant annoyance from the teaching and example of their God-fearing associates. And after a time, they decided to separate from the worshipers of God. Accordingly, they journeyed to the plain of Sinar on the banks of the river Euphrates, there they, attract, they were attracted by the beauty of the situation and the fertility of the soil, and upon this plain they determined to make their home. Here they decided to build a city, and in it a tower of such stupendous height as should render it the wonder of the world. These enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. Second paragraph. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth. We just read that. God was saying, be fruitful, multiply, and um, multiply throughout the earth. So when God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish it and subdue it, but these Babel or Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus, their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of power and wisdom of its builders, not of God, of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generations. So, Scripture tells us very clearly in Genesis 11 and confirmed by the pen of, pen of inspiration, those who chose to reject God rebelled against him so that he confused the language and dispersed them over the face of the earth. So what, what was their rebellion? I think we just read it. It's pretty clear, pretty plain and straightforward. First, they wanted to make for themselves a name for themselves, to bring honor and glory to themselves and not to God. They wanted to be independent of God. In fact, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 123, Ellen White continues to state, the men of Babel 
had determined to establish a government that should be independent of God. In other words, they were rejecting God. They wanted nothing to do with him. So secondly, in their rebellion is they wanted to remain together rather than be fruitful, which is what God had said, be fruitful, multiply, and spread across the earth. So what do you suppose is the root cause in both these ambitions? Selfishness, which is what? It's pride. It's pride. And what do you suppose the cause was the cause of Lucifer's fall from heaven? Pride. It comes down to pride. So what's the lesson for us? What's the practical takeaway from this that we can learn? Why was, must we be careful about seeking to make a name for ourselves? And I will testify to this. I spent probably more than half of my professional career trying to make a name for myself. Big mistake. So what should our motivation be in all aspects of our lives? And I'm talking spiritually, personally, professionally, and socially. Is it to make a name for ourselves? To get the notoriety, the fame, fortune, recognition, pride? Isn't that what we see in the world today? Isn't that what is expressed to us online, in media of all sorts? It's about making a name for yourself, one-upping your competition, etc. So should that be our motivation as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians who are supposed to bring this end-time message of the three angels' message to a dying world? Is that what we're supposed to be bringing them? Or should our motiv motivation be based on our love for God to serve him and to honor him and do as God asks us to do because we love him. So God gives us freedom of choice. The choice is ours, and there are really only two choices that can be made. But they have two very different outcomes, as stated in Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So God gives us every opportunity to be redeemed by him through his plan of salvation. So redemption and salvation is a free gift from God because he loves us. His saving grace and his mercy on humanity. That's why it's a free gift. Our part in his plan of salvation is that through our loving faith in Jesus Christ, that we are willing to let the Holy Spirit restore us from our fallen nature of pride and rebellion, which is exactly what happened here with Babel. But God wants to restore us through the Holy Spirit and cleanse us of that pride and rebellion and turn us back to him. God wants to cleanse us of this so that he is able to shower upon us the full blessings that he has for us. So I thought that Thursday's lesson was, it was so speaking to my heart and making me take a look at my life, past, present, and future. Where should my motivation be? Back Amen. to you, Barbara. Well, it's, you summed it up so nicely. There's a battle for, for each of us, and, and that yeah. goes, fits right in with my final thoughts. <clears throat> oh, good. <laughs> and my final thoughts actually come from the SDA Bible Commentary. It says, In the word of God are represented two contending parties that influence and control human agencies in our world. Constantly these parties are working with every human being. Those who are under God's control and are influenced by heavenly angels will be able to discern the crafty workings of the unseen powers of darkness. Those who desire to be in harmony with the heavenly angels should be intensely earnest to do God's will. They must give no place whatever to Satan and his angels. But unless we are consistently on guard, we shall be overcome by the enemy, although a solemn revelation of God will concerning us has been revealed to all, yet a knowledge of his will does not set aside the necessity of offering earnest supplications to him for help and of diligently seeking to cooperate with him 
in answering the prayers offered. He accomplishes his purpose through human instrumentalities. And so as we see God working through us as humans, what are we building? Are we working with God to build souls for heaven? Or are we working with Satan to build beauty and grandeur on this earth? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for this lesson of Babel. We've seen, Lord, how through time you have been in charge, you have been in control. Amen. Even though man has tried many times to take the reins, thinking that they are God, you have found ways and provided ways to ensure that that doesn't happen, Lord. And we are now at this coming to the end of time, the end yes. of time on this earth as we know it. Amen. And Lord, we know that the battle is fierce for every soul, for every heart, and for every mind. So we pray, Lord, that you would be with each person here, each person, each loved one in our lives, e everyone, Lord, who loves you, that you would help them hang on to you through the trials, through the struggles, because as our lessons showed us, if we take our mind off you, even for a short time, we're in danger. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, thank you for your spirit who's worked in our hearts and minds to present your words, your thoughts to each of us. So th we pray, Lord, that you would bless the Sabbath and that we may enjoy a beautiful day with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Happy everybody. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.